I hope you have a Bible. Today you'll need a Bible again. So if you have your, your iPhone or your cell phone or whatever, you can look it up. The password's on your bulletin, Romans 15, 13. Or you can get a Bible just outside here. Nate and Salim's going to help hand them out. We're finishing what we started last week, which was Psalms. And I told Lisa this morning, I was excited, and I said, Lisa, I said, I think I should just go teach at a seminary somewhere, like a Bible school, and teach the Bible. I was all excited, and I always enjoy getting prepared. And Lisa said, well, you have your own students right here. So <laughs> I get excited, and you know that, and, and sometimes I'll give more information just like I'm teaching. And so thanks for your patience. Some of you really love the extra details that I give you, and some people not so much. So like, well, but there's no test here. You don't have to remember it. You just wait. And someone told me last week, they said, you know what, I'm sorry, but when we got to like the third psalm that you were talking about, I just started thinking about that, and I didn't really remember anything else you said. I said, well, that's great. If you, can, if you can remember one thing and take it home with you, that's the idea. So of all the different things that we're talking about, there's a lot of different people here. And I think about you, and I pray for you, and I study this. And something that we say today is here to encourage and equip you. So you want to look up Psalm 120. Now, most of you know, some of you know that a year ago, Lisa and I went away for a while. And one of the things we did is we asked for a, 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 a time off and we went to Spain and we walked the pilgrimage that is called the Camino de Santiago and the Way of St. James. And so we had read about it. It was actually someone from this community, David Jacobs, the, uh, the ambassador from South Africa, when he retired, when he finished here, he actually retired and he went to do that. I had never even heard of it. So I started looking into it. Well, Lisa and I went and we walked for 36 days. And we did, I think, about 550 miles, or how many kilometers? 500, it was like 550 kilometers. No, 550 miles. Yeah. So I don't know the kilometers. I'd, there you go, like 800 kilometers. Gracias, Diego. 880 kilometers. There you go. Zach. So... But it's this pilgrimage, and you learn some things about walking. And part of that, then, is my interest in looking at this series of psalms, Psalm 120 through 134, are called the songs, not psalms, but you could call them that, the songs of ascent. And just to confuse us more, I looked it up, and in some places they're called the songs of degree. So I'll just stick with the word ascent. The songs of ascent, ascenso, is because the pilgrims from the days of David and Solomon and the Old Testament, the Jewish pilgrims, when they went up to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was the highest point in their, in their land, as they went up to Jerusalem, they would review through these 15 psalms. And so they're called the songs of ascent. And there's a metaphor of not only going up the mountain, but also going up the journey of life, climbing towards maturity and spiritual and emotional and growth. <clears throat> so we talked about that last week, and I'm just going to remind us of a couple of the points. <clears throat> That's a great thing about Christ Church. There's always some kind of dynamic happening, and you never know what surprise you're going to get. So we just want everyone to be comfortable and to enjoy themselves. So Psalm, the first one we looked at was Psalm 120. And so just quickly this morning, we're going to finish. We're going to go all the way through these 15 Psalms. And the first one, and we just mostly noted the first verse. 
What is my point? My point is that you could go home and two things. You could either have an idea of how to read the Psalms. Say, oh, okay, I didn't realize. I usually just read one Psalm or several is skip around and try to find one that meets my emotional moment or I don't even read the Psalms at all, but we often don't think of them as a group. And I mentioned last week, the book of Psalms, what we call the book of Psalms, was actually for the Jews like a, a hymn book, what we would call a, a book of songs, a song book or a hymn book, and it was divided into five different books. And then those books are grouped into like, and this is one of the little groupings, the Songs of Ascent. So Psalm 120 begins with the words, I call on the Lord in my distress, and he answers me. And then it goes on to talk about the question, where do you want to go? Where do you want to go in life? And the writer of the psalm, and they're generally attributed to David, but the writer of the psalm says, I'm a person of peace, but the people around me always want war, argue, debate, fight. And he says, where can I go um, to find the peace? And so he's looking for that. And that's the person starting the journey up towards Jerusalem on the goal of finding some peace and a place to be a person of peace. So Psalm 122, the next one, we looked at the first couple of words. I'm sorry, Psalm 121. And that is the song that we sang to begin the service. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from you, Lord, maker of heaven and earth. And so how will you arrive to your destination? You're starting up this journey. You have an idea of where you want to go. I want to be a person of peace among people of peace. Well, how am I going to get there? Who is going to help me? And the psalmist draws our attention to looking up towards the Lord. And then Psalm 122. The psalmist begins saying, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. And so as they go up towards Jerusalem to worship, you see this idea of a community. I'm excited about going with some other people. And so I asked the question, who will accompany you? Who will accompany you? And so in this Psalm uh, 122 becomes that uh, well-known passage, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. Verse 6. Sorry, Beatrice, you're translating. Psalm 122, verse 6, 7, and 8. May there be peace within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. This is an amazing prayer, and it has application for every single person today. Paul wrote this prayer in a slightly different version to Timothy in the New Testament. And he said, pray for your rulers and those who are in authority that you could live quiet, peaceable lives and mind your business and live your life. And so we see war and conflict and craziness in the countries, even the countries that seem reasonably stable. And the writer in the Psalms is saying, you know, pray for the peace of your city, the place where you are for the leaders, for their prosperity, for their security. And so that's a whole concept that gets repeated over and over. But as you look into these Psalms, you find these treasures of ways that guide us how to live. So Psalm 123 Verse 1 says, I lift up my eyes to you who sit enthroned in heaven. Again, we have the same image, lifting your eyes up, looking to the Lord. Why? Because you know, I had a friend that was visiting, and she came as an exchange student. And yesterday we had to, she stayed at our house for a few days, and then we took her to her house in Positos. So with all respect to Positos people, it could be anywhere. It could be my hometown in Kentucky. But as we got out of the car, it was like, oh, there's this smell. And so you look down and there's like, you know, dog poop all over the place. And so because everyone walked their dog and there's no green grass or area, so the dog just does his business on the sidewalk. 
And so, and the tree roots, it's all kind of broken. And so it was a, it was a really cute area. And we were looking, how cute, how neat, the house and the painting and then stuff. And then I said, oh, yeah, remember, when you're walking here, you need to look down. You need to, like, look where you're stepping, watch your feet, because you'll trip or you'll step in something. And it's just like a habit you need to develop. Well, in life, because of the problems and the dog poop and the broken sidewalks, we start just looking down. And when you're looking down, you just see what's in front of you. And that's important. But if you don't look up, you don't see like the beautiful sunset of the Rambla. You don't see the sky. You don't, there's many things you miss. And the psalmist is telling us, remember, look up. Because the problems, they're all around you. And you'll always be there. But God has better things. And he'll look up and he'll guide you. <clears throat> So that's Psalm 123. Psalm 124, we talked about scripture, how do you pray, how do you, that was, I'm sorry, Psalm 123 asked the question, how will you find mercy when life gets hard? The psalmist says, we have endured much. How do you find mercy? And so we looked at some scriptures from Hebrews. The next Psalm 124, the pilgrims are going up the mountain and they're thinking, and they're singing and they're talking. And then the pilgrim says, If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say. And he talks about the problems and how they've survived. And it's interesting in Psalm 124, all of the pronouns are plural. It's all about the community. It's about the group. It's about the people going together. It's about the family. And there's this sense that we lose in our modern world here. Often the life becomes about me trying to survive or trying to succeed or trying to do whatever I need to do. And here in the psalm, we realize whatever happens to me affects those around me, the decisions I make, the things that I do. And so we're in this together. There's a gift that's called community. And so unity is a gift. In communion, next week we celebrate communion, our communion service on the first Sunday of the month is an expression of the unity that we can experience, which is a gift from God. Then Psalm 126 is where we pick up today. So let me change my paper. Psalm 126. Verses 1 to 3. Many of you just studied the book of Nehemiah last semester. And so you remember there was a time when the people of Israel, actually it was the nation of Judah, the southern nation, had been carried off captive. And they came back from their captivity in the book of Nehemiah after 70 years of captivity. And so this psalm says, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, Zion meaning Israel, Jerusalem, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. And it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. As a community, we're called to share each other's burdens. And we find our strength in the Lord. That's what the Psalms previously have been saying. But here they're saying we also experience as a community joy. And so shared joy. When one person is experiencing joy, we can all share in the joy of that person. So the captives coming back from Jerusalem, and if you studied the book of Nehemiah, if you've never heard of Nehemiah, it's a pretty awesome little book to read. You can read it in a short time. And it tells a fascinating story. But these people came back from their captivity, and it tells how the nations around them were against it. And then they were amazed, and they said the only way they could accomplish what they, had, what they did in the book of Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem was with God's help, because that was an impossible thing. So being in a community and hearing the joys of other people, 
not just their sadness and their sorrow, helps us to realize how much God is doing. Sometimes we're having a hard time, and we hear from somebody else some good news. Now, we can be bitter and say, how come all the good things happen to you? Or we can say, huh, I don't really believe that. The person always says, like, good stuff, but I don't believe it's really happening. Or we could say, you know, isn't that great? Good news. God is working in different places and at different times in people's lives and around the world. So then we can give thanks. It can help us to give thanks when we're having a hard time to know what to give thanks for. It's like that part of that lifting our eyes up. The joy of the Christian life comes in sharing what we have already received. And last week I said, remember the four R's, receive, recognize, redistribute, and repeat. That's a secret for joy. Receive, whatever good things we've received in life, James said, comes from God. So receive it, recognize what it is, or the feeling, the stuff, whatever, if it's material or emotional or spiritual or knowledge, you have something you've received, redistribute it. Share it with somebody else and then repeat. If you get caught up into that cycle, you'll find a lot more joy in your life. So Psalm 127, they're going on, they're traveling up the mountain and now into Psalm 127. And they're halfway along and maybe some of the pilgrims are tired and they're saying, the young ones are saying, how much further is it? And we had some days like that. One day Lisa and I were walking on the trail in Spain and it was hot, and we got to a place, and we'd been sort of walking with near the same group of people for a few days, and so we said, you know what, let's push on a little further to the next town, and then we'll be ahead, and we'll like be with a different group of people, there are a lot of different pilgrims walking, and so you can slow down or speed up, we didn't want to slow down, we said, let's speed up, and I always very creative and ready to do something spontaneous, hadn't really planned to go further but I said well we'll go further look on my on my phone here it says there's a little town and it's just like seven more kilometers seven kilometers yeah you know it's a little bit of extra effort but we'll be there for dinner you know so we'll walk on to that next town and it says here that they have a place to stay everywhere you went there was always a place to stay So we got to the next town, seven kilometers beyond what we normally walk, really tired. And a place was closed. It had closed the day before for the season. And so we're knocking on the door and it's just like closed, the shutters are down. It's just like they're gone, they're done. They've had enough pilgrims and so it said closed for the season. We were just like... And there's a small town in Spain. There were like four houses. So I was like, okay, there's nothing here. So we have a choice. We can walk back or we can walk forward. Forward was like, I don't know, six more kilometers. I don't remember. Lisa says I always exaggerate the numbers. I don't remember, and she's right. So you can ask her if you want to know exactly. I just know that day we walked so far. It was, it was like... By the time we got into the last town, we were just dragging. We were, it was hot and, you know, we weren't, your feet hurt because you're walking day after day. So maybe for one day hike, you know, I don't know, Cody, it made you do some hikes, but we, that for us, we were, it was too far. It was hot and we were tired. And so probably at that point is where these pilgrims were asking the question in Psalm 127 is organized. So they get there and it says, you know what, guys? Unless the Lord builds the house, the work is in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling, working for food to eat, for God grants sleep to those he loves. I thought, wow, so all this is for nothing? Unless the Lord does it. That's a common theme in scripture. And it, Jesus said it when he was teaching his disciples. He said it in a different way. He said, you know, 
Anyone who hears these teachings of minds and puts them into practice is like a wise man, a wise person who builds their house on a rock, on a solid foundation. And when he built his house, the storms came and the house stood firm. But the foolish man heard the teachings, ignored them, and it was like building his life, his house on sand. And he built a beautiful house. But when the storms came, the storms of life, the hard circumstances, the crisis, the winds blew and the waves beat against the house and it fell because it was built on sand. And so we've said sometimes, when you get into a crisis, when a crisis happens in your life, you don't have time to become the person that you wish you were. Does that make sense? When the crisis happens, you don't have time to become the person that you wish you were able to manage it. When the crisis happens, all you have is the person you already are. That sounds tricky, but that means you need to start, and I, we need to start making decisions today that will help us be the better person, ready to handle the crisis before it comes. And we don't know what crisis is coming. It could be financial, it could be health, it could be weather, it could be, anything can happen tomorrow. We really don't know, and things do happen, crisis do come. And so the psalmist is saying, remember, if you build with the principles of trusting the Lord, of looking up, of being thankful, of having community, then you're in a place to withstand the crisis. I had a good example not so long ago. I was talking to somebody, and they weren't sure what to do about a family situation. I said, who do you ask for advice? Well, the people around them were people whose I thought, if you spend your time with foolish people, then when you need good advice, who are you going to ask? Because if they can't make a good decision for their own life, they make bad decisions repeatedly, they may be good people, and you're their friend, and you help them, and things like that, but you need some friends also. They could be older, they might be younger, but they... You need some friends or some people in your life that when you say, I need some advice on how to talk to my mom. I need some advice on whether I should spend money here or not. I need some advice on, there's every kind of thing. My health. Who are you going to ask? So that's part of what he's saying. What are the principles? What are the things that we're doing? And it also means that your life, my life, is not all about me. It's about what God is doing. And so it's a lot easier in life, takes a lot of pressure off if I can say, in the midst of my circumstances, which might be good or they might be really hard, I can say, how am I going to survive these circumstances? How am I going to be the one that, the superhero from the movies? Or if the difference is if I can say, how is God speaking to me through these circumstances? How is God coming to me? What's the difference? In the one, I'm like active, trying to make something happen. And in the other posture of saying, how is God coming to me? I'm still active, but I'm more active in silence, waiting. I'm actively waiting, saying, God, what are you doing? It's truly amazing if we can try to be still and try to be silent and remember, maybe God is speaking to me. Say, well, I'm waiting for a voice. I don't believe that. Well, it could be a voice. It could be a dream. It could be a person that comes and gives us some advice. And because we stopped trying to make something happen, all of a sudden, somebody's advice makes sense. We say, wow, you know what? I never thought of that. You know, the reason I walked all those extra kilometers, at least and I survived, it wasn't a terrible thing, but we'll never forget it, that one long walk. Well, it's because we made a plan with some good advice, and we had a good app on the phone and figured it out. But in the impulse of the moment, I had a, a brilliant idea. Let's go further. Let's do a little bit more. 
And if I could have just stayed with the plan, followed the principle, we would have had a few less blisters. And a blister on a pilgrimage lasts with you for a while, trust me. So sometimes we have the consequences of choices we've made. Okay, let's go on. Psalm 128. Psalm 128, verse 6. May you live to see your children's children. So verse 1 is, Blessed are all those who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. In the Old Testament of the Bible, when it talks about fear, it's not talking about being afraid, like I'm trembling, I'm afraid. It's talking about amazement, awe, wonder. And so blessed are those, blessed, happy are those who have the Lord, their awe and wonder in who God is. And then he ends the psalm, he says, may you live to see your children's children. So the blessing of family, it's interesting. Our family could be the, our biological family, the immediate family we think of, and the extended family. And it's amazing how many of us have conflicts within our families. Immediate family, extended family, family reunions. And, but there's also a spiritual family. And the goal of a Christian should be to grow from being just a baby, a baby spiritually who knows very little, and to being a child. And I know Jesus said it's good to have childlike faith, but that means like really trusting the Lord. But a child is not able to help other people. Now, having the simple childlike faith, but continuing to grow towards maturity, where your life becomes more like an adult and eventually an elder, where people look to you for counsel and help. And they say, that is a person that's showing me how to grow older or how to manage these different things. And we see their lives and our lives can be a model. And so the blessing is to see the people you have helped and then how they're helping other people. So we can be spiritual parents and grandparents as well. Psalm 130. You say, I skipped one. I did. You can read it at home. Psalm 130. You know, the Psalms can be confusing because I told you these were the songs of ascent. But if you look this up, I looked it up on a computer. I checked out to see what do they say about Psalm 130 because it's a famous psalm. And they said it's a psalm of penitence. I said, of penitence? Why of penitence? And it has this famous line, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let my ears be attentive. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? And so you have this solemn prayer of a person saying, Lord, if you counted my sins, I would be destroyed. I have so many sins in my distress. I'm crying out to you for mercy. That's all I can do. Well, this psalm, some of you already have recognized it, um, from the Man of La Mancha, if you ever heard the musical. This psalm is called De Profundis in Latin. And in traditional liturgies, this is the prayer, the psalm that is read right before they bury the body of someone who has died. And so if you're familiar with Psalms, or you hear this, or maybe, you know, if you, at some time in your life, if you went to church in Latin, then you'd hear these words. And you would think this is a psalm of penitence, a psalm of death, of like sadness and seriousness. And maybe you wouldn't even keep reading. But here's why I like for you to read your own Bible, to read your own psalm, and sometimes not to do all the commentaries. You know, people make up a lot of stuff. And we can get caught in traditions that limit us. So reading De Profundis, which means out of the depths in Latin, before you bury somebody, reminds us that God's mercy reaches beyond the grave. And that's why they read it. But over time and years and, tradition and centuries of tradition, we begin to think this is just like a prayer for the dead. It's like a ritual psalm. And we forget the part, verse 4, with you 
there is forgiveness and therefore you are feared or therefore we are in awe. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits and in his word, verse 5, I put my hope. Verse 7, O Israel, people of God, put your hope in the Lord for with the Lord is unfailing love and with him is full redemption. And so this really, to me, is not a psalm of penitence. It should be a psalm of tremendous confidence. With the Lord is full forgiveness, unfailing love, love that never fails. Remember, we read that from Lamentations. Same theme over and over and over in the Old Testament. The prophets and the psalmists say God's love will never fail. So our perspective could be wrong. It could be that we're looking down at the sidewalk and, you know, seeing what's there. And that's our perspective of Positos. Instead of looking up, and Positos is a pretty cool, amazing place to be. And so we could be looking at the wrong thing. And in life, we need to know God's love will never fail you. He has Forgiveness In him is forgiveness. So we don't need to look to other places. Well, that flows right into Psalm 131. Because the writer hearing these words and the pilgrims going up the mountain turn to 131 verse 1. And the writer says, my heart is not proud. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful to me. Quick question. Does anybody know the longest psalm in the whole Bible? Which one? 119. Lots of you knew that. What is the shortest psalm in the whole Bible? 117. And so they say that, and I never did the math, so I don't know for sure. People make up a lot of stuff. But the very middle of the Bible is Psalm 118, verse 6. It's, that's right in the middle. So that's an interesting, curious fact. So if you like curious facts, there are three psalms in the whole Bible whole book of Psalms, there are three that are three verses long. The first one is right here, Psalm 131. So you can, if you like those little statistics, 131, 133, and 134. And so this particular Psalm is used in every traditional liturgy of the Jewish faith, the Orthodox faith, the Catholic faith, the Protestant faith, whoever has liturgies, they're written out in prayer books, this is one of the main ones to talk about the Sabbath and about being still and quieting our soul so that we can trust in the Lord. Be still, be in silence. And so tons of things I would like to say, but I have to keep going. And so Psalm 131. Yeah, I'll, have to, I'll skip some stuff. I had some cool stuff to say about that Psalm, but you can ask me later if you're really interested and I'll tell you some more. But when you feel anxious, unsettled, upset, here's something you can write down. You need to know how to plan the, for the future. There are five ways that God guides us. Five ways, very simple. You should remember this. Scripture, does Scripture say anything clear about it? Prayer, do I have peace in my heart when I pray? Scripture, prayer, counsel, Wise counsel. Is there somebody that can give me some good input on this situation? Wise counsel. Circumstances. What are my circumstances? I know some people and they're great Christians and so they think that prayer is the only way and they feel in their heart is the right thing to do and sometimes they're right but sometimes they ignore the circumstances and they create chaos in the lives of people who depend on them because they're so focused on their prayer but sometimes our heart can, can trick us. And so we need to put all these things out there and look, what are the circumstances saying? Is this a, a right time? And the common sense. God gives you common sense. Don't need to just go against it. When you've already walked enough miles for the day and your feet say stop, they told us on the pilgrimage, when your feet say stop, stop. And that one day I didn't. And so we had consequences. Scripture, prayer, counsel, circumstances, and common sense. So, 132 is another great psalm, and it reminds us the first verse, O Lord, remember David and all the hardships he endured. He swore an oath to the Lord. You know how that verse starts off? It reminds us, the Lord remembers his people. 
The Lord remembers your hardships and the Lord remembers your oaths, your vows. So the Bible says don't be quick to make an oath to the Lord because he'll remember. But he knows your hardships and he knows your name. And the psalm goes on to talk about that. So let's finish this morning. Verse 132, 133, and 134 are the other two psalms of only three verses. And 133.1 is the last verse I want to read to you this morning. How good and pleasant it is when brothers, people, live together in unity. How good and pleasant when people could live together in unity. So as you climb the hill of life, as you're on the journey, heading up towards maturity, towards growth, Maybe you want to stop and read these psalms, take some time, but overall, learn to go to the scriptures so that you can have the principles in your life to build well and to look up in faith and confidence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the patience of the people this morning as we sit and listen to so much information and so many different insights. And I pray that some of this could be encouraging and helpful, that can give us a, a blueprint, a way of reading the Psalms, of remembering your faithfulness and your goodness, of remembering that life can be an uphill climb. It often is an uphill climb, and it's a journey, and we need each other, and we need your grace and mercy to help us. So here are our prayers, and as we close the service today and as we go out, into the circumstances of our lives. We pray for your special direction and blessing as Audra travels this week. And as Zach finishes here alone, she makes the next step and Zach finishes his assignment. I just pray for your guidance and blessing for them as well. But all the prayers we've made, all the things we've thought, we put that in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.